Hello and welcome to Angel's Costumes Behind the Scenes. I'm Jeremy Angel. And I'm Jonathan Lippman. And I'm Richard Green. And today we're going to be broadcasting an interview that I did a little while ago with James Clutton. James Clutton is the uh, director of opera at Opera Holland Park, which is a venue that Angels have been associated with now for a long, long time. It's a very important thing to us, although sadly this year, of course, the season hasn't happened. We supply the costumes, both the rental and the new ones for both the the, the, the main singers and the chorus um, for every one of the shows that, uh, that he does, whether it's a modern one or whether it's a period one and we're very very proud of our association with with Opera Holland Park you'll hear in the interview just what a nice guy he is but also just how committed he is to opera and to making it accessible um, to everybody and I think he's done a huge amount to to make opera accessible both in West London, but also in the wider in the wider field, the work that he does in in care homes and in schools and things is really really important. We hope you've been enjoying these conversations. We've been enjoying your feedback. If you have any questions or requests, please send them to podcast.angels.co.uk. You can visit our website, which is www.angelsbehindthescenes.com, or you can find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We are forward slash costume podcast. And here is Richard's chat with James Clutton. Hello, I'm Richard Green from Angels Costumes, and today I'm talking to Mr. James Clutton, who is the Director of Opera at Opera Holland Park. James, hello. Hi, Richard. That's a very nice, you know, James Clutton. It all sounded very lovely there. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Normally, of course, on the 15th of June, you wouldn't have time to talk to me, um, and I'm not sure I'd have time to talk to you, because we'd be right up against it in the the muck and the bullets but of course this season is yeah I mean I think I've said to a few people Richard friends and that I never ever thought that I'm producing the season would be as difficult as producing one but it is (laughs) (laughs) it's harder I would have thought it's harder and the fallout from it's incredible and you know apart from the obvious thing about the business and the the destruction across the country and, and people and businesses generally you just miss that camaraderie that putting shows together do and you get into that annual thing of coming to your place and yeah. all the teams going there and you know there's a there's a rhythm of of life to it of running the summer festival particularly that you just have certain landmarks throughout the year and, and missing all of those and and because i foolishly didn't take a load of stuff out of my diary so i get things still popping up like go to angels you know dress with her oh that, that, that must really hurt that's really kind of rubbing your face in it it is crazy because as you say we should be right in the middle of it at the moment and no amount of sort of conference calls on computers actually makes up for the, the yeah. face-to-face and, and the interaction and indeed the buzz that you get yeah for putting that season on now for, for people who don't know it's been going for a fair number of years. I mean, you, you've you been there 20 years, as far as I know. I've been there 20 I'm... years. The, the, yeah. there's, been yeah. theater, there's been theatre at some level in, in, in Holland Park for for years and years. I mean, there's some lovely Pathé film, if anyone wants to search it out on YouTube, of um, some uh, flamenco dancers in front of our house at uh, in the 60s. Um, <laughs> so there's been theatre there for ages, but the company at Holland Park itself started in 1996. So we're, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary next year. God. Um, so I've been there a long time, and but I think that it's grown and grown. And, and Michael, my co-boss, and I, you know, we we sort of have been there for a long time, and just keep expanding it, keep doing different things, and and just making it better and better, hopefully. Yeah. But you know, I said we're not going to keep talking about it, but then you get something like this year when no amount of experience can prepare you for it. No, but no. Most of the things we've gone through in those years, and a lot of them with you, angels. Yes, yeah. Now, again, for people who don't know, I mean, basically, it's a massive operation. Tell me, first of all, about the canopy, because I'm intrigued by this canopy. I mean, you know, it's uh, Opera Holland Park. Holland Park is a fantastic setting. The backdrop you've got is amazing. So just give us a little bit of a flavour of, of, of how all that works and looks, James, can you? Sure. We're in the middle of a park in West London called Holland Park. So you can see what we did with, cleverly with the name there. Opera <laughs> Holland park. And so um, the park is there all year and it's a very, very beautiful park. And and in the middle of it, there's a, the remnants of a Jacobean house called Holland House that stayed in pretty good nick until the Second World War and then it got bombed. And, um, and since then, it's just been the facade really there. But it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful house. And we base our operas in front of it. We, we build a, a canopy over the whole thing. So even though we're an outdoor festival, the audience and the stage is undercover. 
uh, it's just open at the sides. Uh, we build dressing rooms at the back. Nick, our operations manager, it's a massive job. It takes him like two and a half months to build this thing. We perform for two and a half months, and then it takes a couple of months to take it down. So it, it's really sort of a, a massive job, but it's a thousand seat theater. It's um, well, a thousand and one actually. <laughs> is the one is the one where you sit. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we have that there, and we have to build it every time. But the house itself, being that house of uh, the early sixteen hundreds, you know, has been in its time many things, like a, a square in Seville, it's been a square in Rome. It's lots of different things. Yes. And in fact, yeah. one year we had, we did a, a an opera called Roberta Devereux. Would you make that amazing Elizabethan dress for us? It was around. It was set in Queen Elizabeth I. Is in the opera. And we did it in front of that house, which must yeah. be the most realistic set ever for that opera because, it, it, you know, it's contemporary. And one of the reviews we got was uh, someone saying, uh, who hadn't been to us before, saying the set was just a very sort of faux Elizabethan house they'd built. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, it's very beautiful and we transform it as much as we can. We put things in front of it sometimes, but often, as I say, it just is a house and it adds to the atmosphere of it. Really. Yeah, I mean, it is an incredibly atmospheric place. That whole backdrop is is phenomenal, isn't it? Whatever you do in the front of it with, with scenery and things, you've always got that sort of spine, if you like, that backbone of, of, yeah. of, of yeah. it behind you there. It's, it's, it's great. And actually just going through the back and going out to where all the, the back work is done is, is quite amazing as well. Yeah, it's it's gotten bigger and bigger. I mean, even 15 years ago, there was just porter cabins out the back and people just out in the open, really. But we've we've kept improving it, and it, and it's and it's pretty good, particularly considering it's a you know it's a part time building. The designers that always work the best for us are the ones that either choose to incorporate it or com or completely ignore it. When you, once you start trying to hide it, you fight you fight and lose in battle. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and so you put something in front of it that's so bold and big that. You don't really think about the house anymore or you incorporate it but once you start trying to cover it at any level it, it just becomes meanness and we haven't had that for many years now because it just never really works no no and i mean it's a massive operation just in terms of sheer numbers i mean the, the orchestra is about 40 odd musicians isn't it and your chorus numbers on some of these productions you do are I'm pleased to say because of the costume hires, very large. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a lot of people. Throughout the year, the, the, the number in the office permanently is pretty small. It's about uh, 20 people. Yeah. In the summer, it builds up to something in the region of, of 200 at any given point. Because, as you say, we have 40 to 50 in the orchestra, 40 to 50 in the chorus, all the principals, all the teams that make it happen, the front house staff. So this, this little village sort of ex gets made in the mm -hmm. summer. It's pretty, in a nice way, actually, but it's pretty claustrophobic because we're there all summer and, you know, you, you see everyone every day and everyone's working on different shows and the same shows. And it's a, it's a great feeling to it and there's a real momentum to it. I mean, it takes you a while to get over it when it stops. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, 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 it's a big operation. And I think that one of the things that I hope people are noticing uh, in, in, this, uh, in this crisis is that the sheer amount of jobs and, that are involved in putting theatre or opera on that are not on stage. And, you know, there's an easy, easy thing to say, oh, well, singers or actors and that, but there's so many people that have been working on a show, yourselves, builders, set builders, painters, people that uh, print the programmes. There's so many people involved in this economy. Yeah. And that's why it's such, a, it's such an important economy for us all. Yes, it is. Certainly your season is extremely important to us and we have a great relationship, I think. We do. Again, people don't know, James will employ freelance costume designers and, and, and set designers to come in. There are normally four or five or possibly six different productions going on for each season. I think we we're on five, weren't we, this year? Yeah. It's supposed to be yeah. two, two up at the moment, two coming up yeah. and then Pirates yeah. and Penzance. And basically, I'm delighted to say we, we are, I suppose, your costume house. Well, you are. We get everything from you. And, mm. and, it's, and it's, it made such a difference. I mean... We've been doing it a long time now, obviously, together. But I think that, you know, we went back ages when we used to just get one or two costumes from you. And Tim rang me, uh, Tim Angel rang me and came to my office and just talked to me about what you as a company could do if we if we went there in its entirety. And it was one of the best and pivotal decisions that we've made in that company's recent, hit, well, not even that recent anymore, but recent history, just to change the way we did it and have it, having it all under one roof with you and the, and the expertise that you and all your team have and also the repetition of us coming back and 
oh, we need it a bit like that one, or you know, that's you know that show we did three years ago, Richard. You know, we need it a little bit that sort of color palette or whatever. Yes, I yes. That sort of um, institutional memory that we that we have as two companies and two groups of people makes everything so quick and so easy, doesn't it? Relatively, for starting. Again. Yeah, we can almost have a shorthand, can't we? We can yeah. say, you know, we, we want this and we want this, and of course, again, having the continuity of somebody like Sage, yeah. who. who sort of helms it here irrespective of the costume designers she yeah. she heads up the team that sort of actually does the yeah, great and yeah yeah, looking yeah. At all the designers there because obviously i can, as you said at the very top of this i can't always get up the dew in it and so no. I, there has to be a level of trust on every level with me and you and me and tim but Sage working for me all the designers and everyone who works for you and we just have to have that trust, on, and we've had for many years of just making these things happen. We do four, five, or six shows with you, and we always try and incorporate some makes. Again, I know you believe very, very strongly that it's important that your certainly your lead characters and your designers have a have a degree of freedom and a degree of treatment, a yeah. you know, special treatment, which is which is good. Yeah. And again, I, I always have to to run all of this stuff by you because there are budget limitations on each show but it works doesn't it, it i really think it does. Does. i think the thing is though for, for, for people that are listening to understand this the thing is that yes you know you have an unparalleled collection of costumes uh, in this country probably the world so obviously most things are going to be there but there's something about designing specifics bespoke costumes particularly for leading ladies or leading men that uh, that can just add to a feeling of well-being and, uh, and and worth given from from the company, and yeah. and then you can sell. You can get everything you need here. But if we need a couple of specifics, then let's do it. And I think it just it's just that little twist on that that just gives it a little bit of freedom for designers. Because obviously, some well, not obviously, but it is the truth, as you know, that some big big opera houses would make every costume. Now, yeah. that's just not anywhere near feasible for, for a company of our size and possible argument, should that be feasible anywhere, but, but certainly a company our size, but the, the sheer amount that you have to hire, but then to add that onto it, so, well, we need something very specific here, let's make it, just gives it a very different uh, level of freedom and artistic output, I think, which really helps all the designers and us. Yes, yes. And of course, let's, let's not be coy about this. Some of, your, some of your singers are slightly larger than the norm. <laughs> <laughs> there are occasions when, when we, we just don't have anything that's going to fit them. But having that freedom again as well, because you know, there is that you know, yeah. sort of the old cliche about you know, you're going to cast someone that can fit the costume. But I think that obviously we, we don't go anywhere near that. And I, but I think that just having that ability to say, we've got this person who happens to be six foot seven. Um, I mean, I remember there was a, a production of Aida, I think a few years ago, where we had about four people that were over six, six in the chorus. I know, I know. <laughs> but the, uh, well, we should have maybe changed that. But yeah, I think that the ability to come to you and change those things and, and as we've said a couple of times already, that sort of dialogue and trust to say, well, yeah, what what do you actually need? What can we what can we use on here? And yeah. not just the obvious things all the time. The other thing that strikes me is that you give your loyalty very much to your performers, and your performers give you that loyalty back because the names, the same names, come up season after season after season. And in fact, I would say partly that you've nurtured some of these people, wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I think I would say that. I mean, as far Mm. say it like you but that's very nice but yes I, I have done that but i think that there's a level of continuity we're we're, we're pretty close to being a repertory company that, that yes yeah once a year you know there's a lot of the same people there's always space to get new people in and i probably deliberately mix it up a bit every year so that it doesn't become stagnant mm. but i think having that base once again the same thing that we're talking about about shorthand as long as it doesn't become too easy or too stagnant haven't shorthand where you, you know what you're going to get from someone and they know what they expect from you and and that can go on. I mean, I'd run the company all year like that if we could, but there's, you know, yeah. we've got that yeah. sort of money. But having those sort of people come back, particularly in our chorus, there's a lot of chorus people that come back year on year. Yes. And, you know, and, and they feel like they're coming home. But, but also with the principals, as you said, you know, there's some of our chorus that have gone on to become big principal singers uh, around the world, let alone principal singers for us. So seeing yeah. that journey for them, it's, you know, it's really rewarding that. It's a beautiful thing to see when you've seen someone that's at the start of their career and over 
six, seven years or a decade, I've seen them get to the top. That's just a gorgeous thing to, to be involved in. Well, funny enough, I remember being very impressed by you. We've done an interview with Vanessa from, from Guildhall, and I, I went to a Guildhall production, and there was one guy that was phenomenal, I thought. Mm. Um, and I mentioned it to you, and you said, yeah, I've seen him, and I've been there. <laughs> you were already aware. You'd already done your kind of, you know, your your research and your homework and things on, on some of the younger performers that are, are possibly coming through. Yeah, I think that's what it was great of you to say to me. But I think what happens, Richard, is I think that started years ago, nearly 20 years ago, really, for me, as it was it was an economic ph- philosophy then. We couldn't afford people f- of a standard then. It, it was very much, let's get young singers when they're coming out of college. Yeah. But then it became more of a philosophical, as years went on, it became a philosophical thing. And like football teams, I mean, I never talked to football with Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, again, that isn't true <laughs> because I'm the person sitting in the room going. I know, I know. <laughs> it's like a football team, though, and I think you have to balance experience and and youth and and nurture people. And I think that it's still important for me and all of my team, actually, all the people in my office, to get to see as much stuff at uh, music colleges, conservatoires, to see who's coming through because mm-hmm. we can move quite quickly. Um, we know we don't have a massive turnaround of three or four years of being booked up. Ours is normally a year, eighteen months or something. Yeah. So if we see someone, we can move quickly. And then once you once you've got them in with you and they and you treat them well and they enjoy being there, then it's easier to keep that going as they as they go through their career. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it's sort of it, it's just part of my job. I don't think there's anything even good about me that sort of thing that's just what i should do because that's that's what i get paid for to find these people and and it's enjoyable to go and see people anyway at the start of their career yeah and then think okay how can i fit them into what what we've got planned Mm. so we've established you're the kind i'm going to show my age here we've established you're the kind of the matt busby of the uh, of the operatic world going around and, and talent spotting but it actually goes deeper than that doesn't it because i know that you think that the whole school project is is an important one yeah well we have uh, we have had an outreach project called inspire for many years now um, um since 2008 i think and I absolutely believe this, that it's not in any form an added part of our company. It's not a, It's not any distance at all. It's just as central as anything we do on our, on our main stage. So, you know, that would range from, and in fact, during the lockdown, we've upped our output of, of things like that rather than reduced it. Uh, we go to a lot of care homes normally in hospitals yeah. and, and perform for people in there. So we've done a lot of that by Zoom uh, remotely recently. Um, we do a lot of work with schools. In fact, tomorrow would have been one of the great days of our season. It would have been the schools matinee tomorrow. Yeah, I was going to say you have that every year, don't you? You, you. Oh, you it's an amazing yeah. thing, Richard. Really, you know, we have a thousand. Even when I, because it was my idea, but you know, you're never sure what, how it's going to work. But we have a thousand kids in to our theatre. We don't reduce the opera at all. We don't change the language. It's just a full opera. So last year. It was Ballerin Masquerade by Verdi, yep. full opera, and with surtitles up on the screen. And all of the kids, I've got a lovely bit of film of it where all the kids screaming at the end like it's a pop concert. And it's and I think part of it is because you treat them with respect as an audience member. You don't try and, we don't try and talk down to them. We do workshops with them, building up to it, explain the story, tell them what to look for, you know, suggest ideas to, to read about it. And come in, they just enjoy it. There's not, it's not sort of wrapped up in in anything worthy as such. It's just, this is a good show and you'll enjoy it. And I think that we've had from that over many years has been great. And so so we've got that tomorrow, which obviously we can't be performing, but we're doing some online work with all the kids that signed up to it. So the thousand kids are still doing something with us tomorrow. And then you've got the Alice thing in the park, which again, I know you've run over a number of years, which is uh, again, costume and, and children interacting presumably with yeah well i think that one of the things we looked at there was that these there's particularly in this country really there's often a, a real sort of anti-snob thing about opera and people thinking that they they won't enjoy it and yet if we strip that away so we did a we did a one hour version of alice's adventures in wonderland that we commissioned and uh, it was in the park itself and it moved around the musicians moved around the singers moved around the audience moved around and to different parts of a park. And um, we sold it out every performance for, I think, five years. 
And because people then just were so close to the musicians or the singers and ran up close to the action, all these kids just enjoyed it as a show. And my thing I said a lot about that particular piece was, obviously I prefer if they enjoyed it and that most of them did, but there's also a bit of me that was just giving them confidence to say that they'd been and they liked it or they hadn't liked it. You know, it's just, you know, go, go, and, go and, you know, test it, go and taste it. And if you don't like it, that's fair enough. But one of the things I always say is if you go to a restaurant and you didn't like a meal, <laughs> you don't say I don't like food. You know, you, you say you don't like that meal on that day in that restaurant. And you'd go to another restaurant another day and you try the similar thing or you try something different, but you would just write it off. And I think some of it is just confidence about, do you like this? No, I don't really like it. And then being able to talk about why they don't like it. And because people say to me all the time, oh, you love opera. I said, yeah, I like a lot of it. Like, there's some of it I really hate as well. You know, it's not a, it's not just a black and white thing that you hate it or you love it. And there can be different bits of the repertoire you love and different bits you, you don't like so much. And that's okay. And having that confidence as a kid, particularly, being able to nurture that confidence in yourself to make your own decisions is just as yeah, important as yeah. getting them to like it. I think. And did you, I mean, again, we mentioned pirates. You were doing a, a tour, weren't you? You were taking, you were taking a, a sort of stripped down version of it on the road to Penzance. Yeah, I mean, Richard, even by my own standards, it's <laughs> just crazy. Did you get there, by the way, before lockdown? Well, we failed in the end. It, we locked, it locked down just a few a few days before we actually made it to Penzance. So we did go to Penzance, but we couldn't perform. So basically, we had a, a stripped-down version, reduced to an hour, uh, piano and ten singers, and we stopped more or less every 30 miles or so to play at a different school or in the early part of the run when it was still safe we were playing in some hospitals and we played in a couple of care homes but obviously for obvious reasons that stopped uh, but we carried on with the schools and we would do two or three schools a day for the the miles down to that so we were on the road for about three weeks and uh, I think we finished two days short of Penzance which was disappointing to everyone but by that stage there was no, no. There's no question we had to stop, but it was it was so exciting because it was like the, you know you'd go into these a different school or as I say a couple of schools every day, do the same thing again. We'd do a workshop in the morning, do the show in the afternoon, and seeing the kids transform to a little bit like you know, what we're doing here to jumping around and singing along at the end of the show is just was a great thing. It's yeah, just about putting yeah. culture in front of people some of the drives i mean because we went about halfway just driving there and driving back in the day and then after that we started staying away um so some of those drives are quite extraordinary with you know i i drove a couple of them money drove a couple of them um we've got like four or five singers <laughs> in the car with some pirates all the way along <laughs> yeah. it was, they're, they're, they're a good time and um and we will do that again and we had great cooperation with the education trust down in the southwest who helped to set it up but yeah, we played on whatever it was, 25 different schools over three weeks. It was it was a lovely thing to do. Yeah, yeah. And we did the odd hat for that as well, didn't we, I think? <laughs> we did indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think money still got them, uh, you know, money was right now. <laughs> <laughs> on flat to get out. I, I think you're right. I think she sent me an email actually saying, are you ready for them back yet? Or can they keep them? I said, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think she's not going to be throwing any any costume parties. In well, the I was say, but there, there could be a lockdown game there where it's just doing a, 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 pirate, a pirate night every night. She certainly win that one. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's yeah. You did you did a lot for that, and that was very much easier than our normal stuff. That was just very sort of just I say hats and waistcoats and that. Yeah, the kind of formation thing when you go into a school, you all walk in as performers, artists. You get a couple of things on like that, and then you stand on stage or, or often in the assembly hall, and it's just a different transformation to the kids. You know, they want to see a show then, and you say, you know, we're prepared to stand there and say, okay, if you give us forty five minutes, we're going to hopefully really entertain you. And then it's down to you. And if you know, kids' audiences are brilliant because if you don't entertain them, they just turn off. Yeah, you say no, don't you? you, 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 you know, there's no, there's no <laughs> lighting it up on that. So it's really sort of that's a harsh audience, but a great one because it means everyone has to infuse it with such energy and drive that it's normally a really good show. Most of your operas are featuring sort of. 18 men chorus, 18 women chorus, 36, multiply that by two costumes, 72, sometimes three. I mean, these are big, these are big production numbers, both for, for us and, and for you. And of course we fit everybody here. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we'll, we'll fit the same people in two different 
ranges of outfits for for yeah. the two different shows and things but it, it is a it is a big operation and um the team that you have back there because sage obviously is 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 this side setting things up you've got a separate team haven't you back at the back at base actually running the wardrobe on a performance base yeah. I mean, we're not too far from you geographically, really. Yeah. But the thing is that it, it, it takes up so much time for everyone. As you say, you know, you, you remain very calm on that, Richard, as you say. It's been a year since I felt the pain when you think about it. So actually, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, two or four rooms, because, um, you know, once again, it's not obvious if you're not involved with us, but, you know, when we have to fit people, often we're taking people out of rehearsal rooms, so we don't want, or the director uh, rightly doesn't want the, the singer out of the room so much. So if we can get both designers or two designers to you and they can go in and be fitted for Pirates Penzance in two rooms and then into uh, La Traviata in other ones, we'll try that. Now that's an yes. incredible um, a logistical thing for SAIDs, for you, for all your staff. And I think it says a lot about the um, the relationship that we've got, but also the positivity that comes out of all these things. So those days, however crazy they are, are pretty good fun. They are. <laughs> however mad they are, be, and they are mad, let's be fair. But there's there's a there's a sense to it that you're really moving forward and you really get it, you know, get it off pat, don't you? It's really quick and people are in and out. And because Saints and your team know your stop, which is, you know, goes on forever so well. Yeah. You know, I've been there when this happened. You know, oh, I know exactly what we want and run off to get something slightly different because that one. And when those designers get to know your stock as well, they're, pre they're pretty exciting days, those days. However, in a funny way, because they're so mad. And then when we get to our place, they all get delivered into the theatre and then we've got a couple of staff there that would split them up, get them into individual dressing rooms, you know, make sure that they're all lined up for the right thing and the right person. And uh, and then we, we work in repertory, which is one show on one night and another show on the next night. So it's every night changing the costumes that are out for the next show. So, you know, it's it's, it's a pretty mad thing to do, but, um, but, but as I say, exciting because of it. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And the other thing about... about you, James, is that you're very generous in the sense that you invite our staff, the people who work on the show, both both the people who are fitting the costumes and indeed the workroom people who are either altering them or making making new costumes to come along for, for one of those dress mm. rehearsal performances, which again, I thoroughly enjoy. Um, I, 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 I hope you do as well. And it's it's a very kind thing to do to say thank you to well, our staff for, for, yeah. for, for their work. It doesn't always happen, James. Well, that's lovely of you to say, Richard. I, I, you know, it, it, that's really lovely of you to say. But I also think it's not that kind in some way. It's just a thing of these people have worked on this on this show, and I and I love the ownership, the mental ownership of things like that. We've got two big big relationships in our corporate uh, lives on on the actual shows, and that's with you and our and our mm. set builders. And it's the same things that these people on both companies work away for months on our shows, and then the thought of them not seeing it than them not being involved in that show or, or seeing the fruits of all their work just seems very strange. So we encourage people to come along. I mean, obviously, sometimes you and I would host some drinks with, with all of your staff and with my team and just say, look, we've all done all this work. Now's a bit of time to sit back and say, That's, that was enjoyable, wasn't it? You know, look what we've done. And I think that it's too often too easy to associate people that are working on different parts of the of a show and forgetting about them and i absolutely do not do that or want to do that and i think it's very important when you guys can come along that you do yes but you're generous with your time you'll take you'll take our staff backstage and show them the you know the, the fitting rooms and all of those things and it doesn't always happen james so say so it is a it is something that's very much appreciated well it's very we're very very pleased you do it and i, and I think that it's nice for the people that on your team they've seen it up so up close as they've been making things sewing things or whatever to then see them on stage under the lights it's, it's a different kind of thing isn't it i hope it's a good satisfaction for yeah them. yeah it is and the designers that you have i mean again tend to tend to come back that isn't a case of familiarity breeding contempt but um somebody like takis you know has has done a fair number of them peter of course used to do um a, yeah. a fair share of them as well didn't he uh, great peter right so i still miss him all the time it's one uh, wonderful designers and wonderful human beings peter yeah. rice and yeah. then uh, i think about him a lot i've got some lovely drawings of his here but yes takis uh who's, who's a designer that's worked for us a lot in the last couple mm. of years is is in the same mold really of wonderful drawings really good eye for detail 
and a, and an understanding that there is that graph that is that cuts across cost and what you want and you know because most people could do some good job if they spent whatever money they liked yeah. that's not the point is it the point is to get the best possible job for the for the money you've got yeah. and i think that uh, both of those designers you mentioned takis and peter all have that inherently they they understand that it comes to a cost and they need to do, get as good as they can get for that cost and i think that with you being there so openly and all the team being understanding of that that's why we can get there quickly. We've, we've talked about this. Yeah. And that helps rather than going in and starting again and playing some sort of nonsense game about if we say we've got this, we've really got this. You know, I would say to you very openly um, in, in whenever I come into you, Feb or something, this is the amount of money we've got for these four shows this year. It's what we need to do. And, and you keep tabs and track of that perfectly. And we, we don't. You know, really have any problems because of that? It's a great way. No, we don't. I mean, you're and you're an extremely hands-on director. But do you get? You obviously get to see set box and things like that. Do you get a lot of of costume design beforehand, or is is that that sort of first dress or the first time you see them all together? Kind of like no, no. I've been a lot of drawings and and uh, mood yeah, boards of, yeah. of style of things. Mm. Um, and then on the day, um, because Sades and uh, whoever the designer is often are taking pictures, yeah. and they come straight through to my phone as, as they're doing them. So I'm seeing them one by one as they come through, or every six or something. And so that's nice. You think, oh, my God, what have they, they put him in? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in the past, I've had to ring you and I said, um, James, uh, they've chosen something, but it's like um, £250 a metre. <laughs> and it's like, I think we may have to have a conversation about this at some point. Yeah, we'll do all the and, this conversation then. <laughs> you know, and fair play again, you know, you'll normally say, well, if that's what they want, do it and we'll 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 sort it out somewhere along the way. It's, yeah, I it's, think that as long as people are not being silly is the thing. And and if there's yeah. a way we can do it, and we can try and do it. And if, and if it's just silly, I think that's we can't do that. Mm, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think of that costume where where the guy comes on stage and unpacks his hunt or, 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 or takes the bag. Do you remember that transformation scene where oh, he yeah. actually that Rigoletto? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah the Jester's outfit. And... Yeah, it was like what yeah. the. But actually, it worked incredibly yeah. well. Yeah, and, I, and I've still got a set of straw boaters uh, in stock here somewhere with plastic teapots and cups and saucers glued to the top of them that that oh, Peter yeah. Peter yeah. designed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think, but I think that's right. But I think that you. By seeing stuff early, as I do with advanced copies of the designs, but then seeing it as it happens uh, on the days, you know, you know, even 20 years ago, you couldn't have done this of just having photos sent through straight to you and, True. you know, me being at the park or at my desk and being able to say yes or no. But it's great. I mean, obviously, you know, you don't have a dog and bark myself. That's what I employ those people to do. But it's just great to have it so quickly to say, oh, no, I really don't like that. Or yes, 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 that's exactly what we need, more, more of that. And, and that just enables things to speed up, really. Yeah. Make, it, make, yeah. make it quicker and more and more certain rather than getting a load of costumes to the park and then thinking, I don't really like these, which no one wants, of course. No, no, that, that would be a complete and utter waste of time, wouldn't it? So, yeah. But it's a phenomenal, it is a phenomenal atmosphere going to going to a, a performance there, even when the peacocks decide to join in, which is um, yeah. <laughs> quite the life of me the first time. I thought somebody had hit a bad note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, when we uh, we share a part with some peacocks, but I, um, I, I've i been saying this year that because we've had a year off this year, I'm hoping that they give us a year off next year. And they <laughs> yeah, quid pro quo. <laughs> yeah, we can furlough the peacock next year. Um, but yeah, no, I think that it's, it is what it is, Richard. The thing is, it's a part. It's a theatre in the middle of a park, yeah. and and it has its problems on on some ways of if it's particularly cold or whatever, or or there's peacocks making a noise. Mm. The, for me, the positives always outweigh it because if you sit there, there's an obvious thing of the the light changing naturally. It, you know, most operas go from light to darkness. Most plays and everything, they just tend to anyway. But in our in our place, that physically does that. Even with our stage lighting, it's lighter. We start at seven thirty, and it's all bright sunshine. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully, um, and we finish at ten o'clock, and it's pitch black, and and that's just a gorgeous atmospheric thing that no amount of um, stage lighting could do in in, in a in a normal theatre. Um, that just adds to the atmosphere, and you come out in the interval, and you can walk in the in the in the grounds of Holland Park, and yeah. or go and have a drink or whatever. And I think that 
when I go to other theatres now, that you know, straightforward theatres inside, I feel quite um, claustrophobic because because of that. You know, I, I like having the, the the space around and the nature around it. Mm. And, uh, and I think it's really adds to it for me. I, I think so too. I mean, I think it's a glorious setting. I think it, you know, with the advantage that it's got a, a perfectly waterproof canopy over, and and you know, it, it is it's quite cosy. It's an it's, it is an atmosphere, and it's quite it's quite a nice enclosed. I mean, it's a thousand seats. You know, it's not it's not tiny, um, but it, it yeah. does give you this nice bubble, for want of a better word, of, of performance, performers, audience, and it's all kind of enclosed there. It's it's it's, I, I think, it's very I think special. So. I think. Oh, thank you, Richard. The thing that, because when I go on stage every now and again to say if there's an illness or something, you know, and everyone always groans whenever I go on stage. Because, you know, <laughs> now, kind of, um, but when I go on there, well, well, it's really instructive for me because you remember how hard it is for the singers. Because even though I'm saying the light changes and everything, the first hour or so, uh, yes, the stage lights kick in, you get a nice atmospheric look on stage. But if you're on stage, you can see everything in the audience. And and that it, because it's just bright, and you can see people if um, they're fanning themselves if it's a warm night. You can see if people if you catch the right person's eye at the right time, you can see them look away, look down at their program. Um, and some some singers say to me they they know where the critics sit now and again. They can be in the middle of a note and see the critic lean forward and start making a note. <laughs> And, and and so that is a really strange thing and a really hard thing for concentration. You know, the concentration of artists on stage to remain focused without all of the wind going or the, or the heat or the sun or whatever, or people moving, all those things, just to concentrate on doing the job mm-hmm. is, is a really tough thing. Now, you get after the interval, you know, when I go on stage at the end of the show sometimes, the end of our season or because I'm not used to it, you go up there um, and you just see the stage lights and you can't see anyone, you know, and, and so through the course of it, like you would in a normal theatre, but through the course of the night, you've gone from seeing all thousand people very clearly, whatever they're doing, how they're reacting to you, to not seeing anyone there at all. It's a really interesting transformation. And singers don't always, you know, get it straight away. They, you know, some people just love it. They love it immediately performing on that stage. And others, it's more of a thing they have to work on and get used to and work through how they deal with it. Yeah. That's interesting. It never even occurred to me. Only, of course, you're right. You know, I'm I'm looking at the stage and I'm concentrating on that. So I'm ignoring what's happening to the left and the right of me, i.e. it's getting darker outside. So, yeah, yeah, no, it's it's, 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 it's a very bad Which is one of the reasons why, um, and people don't always like it sometimes, and one of the reasons why we've got a very strict policy on on latecomers coming in, because if you're on stage and you're performing, and in the normal theatre, you can do that in the dark, and that's what people, they, you annoy the audience members that you have to yeah, move. And yeah, that yeah. Not great, but that would be it. But once you start getting a row standing up, of people standing up to let someone in, and, and the concentration just goes completely on there. So that's one of the reasons that we look on a, a bigger picture and say that's why we don't let latecomers in until very specific points. Yeah, it's a very valid point. It's a good point. And you're right, of course, yes, you know, nothing worse than having somebody coming in late and everybody having to stand up or sort of scrunch themselves up and get their toes out of the way and things. Well, <laughs> somebody who's incapable of telling the proper time. How rude. <laughs> but I always worry about that. Now and again, we do a Mozart opera. It tends to be longer and we and we may start at 7.15 and that's the ones we dread, though, of the people. We put everything possible on their ticket and notice saying, come earlier, but... You know, you just dread people coming at 7.30 and saying, well, I didn't realise it was 7.15 start. Um, so we don't do that too much mm-hmm. um, just in case. But, yeah, no, it's it's fine and we get around it. It's just the, the encouragement of just get there on time because it's it's not only the eight people that you might move that get disrupted by it, but it's everyone on stage as well. Yeah. And I have to say your front of house staff are, are very, very good again. I mean, um, you know, courteous, polite. If you you're not getting in if you're late, which is absolutely right, but there's a there's a nice way of telling you that. And again, it's I suspect that the the, the same people come back every year for those sort of um, roles as well, don't they? Yeah, there's a lot of um, there's there's a hell of a lot that do come back, mm. and and I think that it's like anything, like we've talked about quite a bit. It's about a trust and a and a and a and a relationship, and then people just know what they're doing more. And I am absolutely not someone who believes in. You have to keep it the same all the time. I absolutely move, believe in changing things and, and, and moving mm. things. Up. But when you've got um, the, 
the biggest resource that we have as a company and and, and most companies have is people it's a people's business yeah and that might be the people on stage or in the orchestra pit or in the audience or in the, and once you keep that as the priority that it's a people industry then everything else seems to sort itself out from that if and that's why i'm getting too old now i never have people that work for us that that are annoying or badly behaved or rude well what's the point however good they are let's not use them there's just no, there's not enough incentive for me to do that yeah. however good you are if, if you're not going to play by the game and be polite to the right people or to everyone to, to deal with things, then it doesn't matter what job you're in, you're not coming back. And I think that once you get that frame of mind and then you get you, you only get the right people coming back, you might have new people, but they buy into it. And that it's yeah. easier for them to get into as well when they know that, God, this is a place where good behavior does get rewarded and yeah. bad behavior is not tolerated. And yeah. I think that, that that's a good that's a good example to everyone. Yeah. Now, I know I know that you need to go fairly soon, but one of the things I did just want to touch on getting back to this whole education and nurturing thing is the fact that sometimes my heart sinks when I read young chorus or young, no, young, how, how, what is it you do? You do one where you've got the young cast or the, the, the yeah. young singers, which basically yeah. means that we've got to double up on the on the principal yeah. costumes. But again, yeah. that's a, that's a matter of policy, isn't it? That's something that you 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 do as a as a matter of course. Yeah, I think that with, I can absolutely see why for you and for sometimes the stage management, having a young artist cast is the, is the last thing anyone wants. Uh, but I think for me, it was a choice uh, 10 years ago. Uh, great woman, Christine Collins, who's no longer with us, sadly. She uh, came to me with an idea. Well, she wanted to give us some money for something, but not. And she said, uh, I, I said, what, what do you want, though? And she said, uh, opportunities, the word I'm looking for. Mm. And so, well, we started this young artist program, which a lot of companies have now, but this one was more direct and you get full rehearsal periods. You get your, your own director, associate director, you get your own conductor, stage manager, you get time on stage and you get two performances, which is the young artist performance itself yeah. and then the school matinee. So and you get full dress rehearsal and everything. And it just was about, rather than paying lip service to let's... Uh, Let's look after some young artists. Uh, let, let's genuinely nurture some young artists. Let's put, let's put some pressure on them in yeah. a nice way. You know, because pressure is a strange thing that um, you can be great seeing a great actor uh, under pressure, you might not be able to do it. And I think that it's, it's an important point to put pressure on people at the right amount of pressure at the right time. And so to give these performances, it's not like you're at college uh, where all your mates might come, even though it's important. This is a paying audience. But yeah. You know, it's giving you a try, but it's but we're still protecting you a bit because it's a young artist performance. It's a little bit cheaper. Well, it's quite quite a lot cheaper, and just then that they understudy the main cast as well, and it gives them just a bit more responsibility to to work with, really. And it is serious. I mean, it's not. This isn't some sort of play acting. This is serious money, as you say. People are paying paying money to see yeah. those performances. They're being treated exactly as they would be. They're being costumed yeah. the same way. They're being treated exactly the same way as they would be if they were slightly older performers but yeah. put it that way around and again you know this thing comes back we do this with guild hall with their with their people on their costume course you know they come in on their third year and they costume yeah. a show um yeah. in, a, in a in a grown-up costume house and i think those things are really 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 important and i know you do as well Jay. i think that you know you you've obviously been good at it for a long time and i think we have it's just the, the thing that we're only um especially at companies long established as angels you know the pit and but the Holland Park too, but nowhere near the, the length of time. But we're co we're only custodians of those companies at that point. You know yeah. it needs to carry on. Those businesses and those skills need to carry on, and it's no good just saying oh, it's only about today. It has to be about tomorrow as well, and bringing people into the business trained well and to do things in the right way. And I think that all of that adds up to one of the many many reasons why Op Holland Park and Angels have gone so well over the years on a personal and business level. Because a lot of the outlook and the the intentions are the same. Well, I think that's an excellent place to stop it, Mr. Clutton. Thank you so <laughs> much. I started with a mister and I'll finish with a mister. But oh, thank <laughs> you. you guys don't know how much we're missing being up with you that this summer. Um, 
wait till the fans go on and us to be back. I keep waiting for somebody to say, OK, the fire practice is over now. Everybody back. Wouldn't it be nice, though? Wouldn't it be nice? And, of course, the other thing I wanted to mention, of course, was Dougie. But we, we can't. Well, Doug, you know, know Doug's a whole programme himself. We've got, got rest of the show. And, uh, yeah. and we're yeah. still there. We still have lots of laugh about Doug. And, he's, and he lives on with us to this day. I, Great company manager. Yeah. He's always part of our yeah. team and your team. is great. Yeah, no, he's a yeah. great guy. So listen, my friend, you take care. I'll let you get on. But James, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great to talk to you, Richard. Yeah, and you. That was Richard's chat with James. Definitely comes across. He's such a nice guy to, to, to work with, James, and he's such an approachable person. And it definitely comes across that you've built up that relationship over the years and you both get on so well, Richard. Yeah, no, he, he genuinely is a nice guy. And what I think's really good about him is that he's he's passionate about making opera accessible and, you know, getting away from that whole kind of exclusiveness. I mean, you know, he's he's very much focused on the, the, the children and the younger people and getting them involved, um, as, as comes out in the interview. I think what was lovely was the comment about they need to be with the younger people coming in to put the right kind of pressure on them at the right time, which at least it, it, it's it's really nice to know that they've got that in mind, that they're not trying to just give them an easy pitch to hit at. It's you've got to put it on, even though you don't have experience and you're going to have a level of pressure. So you can it, it feels like the real thing. It's not just a, an easy. Well, they, they prove that with the level of casting, the casting of their operas is is aimed high and the creatives that they have working on them are are you know current relevant pra- practitioners there's, yeah. there's that word again and <laughs> as, as with their directors so he's at, he's you know he's put Holland Park on the map as a, as a seasonal opera festival and an important one and luckily because of its proximity to central london you know it has it has relevance in terms of it, its function does he consider himself artistic director as well? I don't know. Give me, give me the definition of an artistic director. That's what I thought his title was because he seems very part of the programming structure and decision making in terms of creatives that are brought on board and directors and the nature and scale of the pieces. By what a definition of artistic director is, which is the executive of an arts organisation or theatre or dance company who handles the organisation's artistic direction, <laughs> in theory, yeah, he does. He chooses what operas and everything goes on there, and he's the one who hires the designers, I believe. So, Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, he's, he's, his title is producer. He's the, he's the person that, we, that we, um, we interact with. He's the person that... Uh, I get approval for for designers if they want to make clothes and you know basically he and I discussing the budgets all the time because although they are I think pretty impressive productions they are budget limitations to them so I suppose in that sense he certainly has a say in these things I mean you know I I will send him a design for from a direct from a designer and say they want to make this and they're making it out of J cloths are you okay with that because um you know, it's it's not much use, not not much use to us afterwards, and he'll make that call, I suppose. What I what I got from the chat between you was that he's very hands on, and he he's he's very comfortable with the language of costume and set design and talking to performers. I would imagine that the people that are employed enjoy the working process because of his input. Yeah, I mean, he is extremely hands on and it's nice to see, you know, when when I go down there, it's nice to see him in his environment sort of, you know, reacting with, with the suppliers and the performers and the artists and the orchestra, you know, he, he is very much kind of the man as far as... Um, yeah. As I'm concerned. With opera, I know we've said before with theatre that you can sort of take a little bit more. The accuracy isn't as uh, isn't as important in theatre because of the distance and everything. That when you compare theatre to, to film or TV, what's the difference in designing for opera to designing for theatre, Jonathan? I would say the scale of the productions, mm-hmm. the size of the sing- of the performers, <laughs> in terms of. <laughs> The ratio, the ratio of singer stroke, you know, the ratio of size differentials between singers mm. and actors by necessity. Uh, singers tend to be larger because of because of what they have to contain within uh, the voice, and yeah. um, it, it's 
and the 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 requirements of singing and movement is a different in the same way that the requirements of singing and dancing singing and moving requires a specific understanding in terms of how you put a look together and um yeah i mean those are the differences essentially yeah, I, mean, I, I, I suppose it's most well, simplistic you've got to allow for expansion haven't you? absolutely because people have got to be able to actually sort of you know really fill their fill their lungs with, with yeah with and, and so, gone are, gone are the days when you would watch grand opera you know whether it's puccini or mozart or you know where, where the singer literally came on and stood and sang yeah that's yeah. that's not a requirement anymore it, it's now a singer has to be able to come on, sing and move. Act. And yeah. act, <laughs> perform. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the days of, of people falling at the knees of the, well, I suppose Callus broke the mould, but prior to Callus, you would have literally some massive, uh, either male or female <laughs> singer coming on, literally, and it was just all about Belting the Belting it out. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I suppose, pre, again, pre-microphones, pre-ampage, pre, pre-little pre little sort of microphones nestling in the hairline and things. Um, these people had to be able to project. The other thing with Opera Holland Park, which is which James has fostered with the, the team he's built up there and the way it works is, each one of them, it's normally four or five. Is it four or five every season, Richard? Is it? Um, uh, it used to be six, um, six. and it's dropped okay. down now sometimes but, to four, sometimes five. But the organisation and the scheduling of it all is, it's mm. a, they have to run a tight ship. It's just as um, uh, just as busy and hands-on as any film or TV production you work on. But you sometimes, oddly enough, we get a bit more time, I feel, with Opel and Park. You might say, no, I'm completely wrong, but I always feel the costume team have a little bit more time and some of the productions of the same size. Yeah, um, no, I, th- I think that's very true. And I mean, but, you know, they have big choruses on these things. You know, mm. there's probably 15, 15 male, 15 female chorus plus, um, and they've sometimes got two or three changes. So, you know, we the, these aren't small productions that they and we do. You know, it's 100 plus costumes on quite a lot of these things. Mm. Plus the principles, plus the makes. I'm taking your comment before about the artistic director, which is okay. We, we we can say what position roughly James has if we were to compare it with film or TV or theatre, which is basically the producer or the uh, producer slash line producer. More, I suppose it's combined. Do you, Richard, find that he's far more hands on than anyone uh, in his position equivalent? Like, I mean, I suppose. On um, Fiddler, David Babani was quite hands-on with it anyway, Jonathan, or am I being speaking out of turn there? Is, is that the yeah, sort he's, of... he, yeah, but that, he's the artistic director of that house in the same way mm. that James is. So, I mean, oh, no, on, on Fiddler, for argument's sake, Jonathan, again, you know, there was a director, there was, uh, you know, a lighting director, there was you, there were, there were all sorts of people that were, were contributing to the success mm. of the thing. But would mm. David step in at some point and go, no, I don't actually want that? happening oh he was he absolutely and that's yeah. his prerogative as as yeah. as, the, as the person responsible for for ultimately bringing the show to the to the stage paying for it mm. basically well no it was a it was a lovely a lovely conversation and a sad thing that we didn't have opera holland park this year but at least, uh, there's, there's so much that that opera holland park do which i didn't realize um which was nice to hear james talk about and how they're trying to do outreach to schools and everything like that to try and bring opera to, to people who wouldn't think of it before. So it's great. No, it's great, Richard. Our next interview we will release will be my chat uh, with, with Jay Marcantonio, who is the supervisor of Strictly Come Dancing. Yeah. Uh, we've been working with Strictly for a few years. It operates quite differently to some of our other productions as it's live TV every week. Um, we uh, Daniel works very closely with Jay and I do too, and it's always been a fun collaboration. She's someone who's got a great story she also is a mill uh, she's also a milliner uh, and I we talk about and we'll get into in the interview next week but she's also given me one of my best ever thank yous from any actor we've ever worked with which we go into working for live tv what Strictly's like and how how she got there in her career so I hope you enjoy it and here's a small excerpt of my chat with Jane my first supervising job was on Brighton Rock and the designer was Julian Day, and we had been f- friends prior to this, and I respected him very much. And Shida, his wife, who is his assistant slash um, supervisor, 
But Julian was really good and allowed me to supervise on Bright and Rock, the, the crowd, which gave me the bug because I thought this is really what I want to do. I enjoyed it. It was it was really long days, but it was massive amounts of people. Like we were starting at three in the morning, three in the morning. And by seven, you'd dressed like 200 people. But it was such a sense of achievement, especially for a period drama as well. 